to this special edition of The Matrix. Uh, my name is Malik Moazan Dolat. I'm a professor in critical theory and social justice here at Occidental College. Um, this is the beginning of our fall series of The Matrix. And so we'd, I, first I'd like to do is to introduce uh, my colleagues in the department. Um, first, Professor Caroline Heldman, who's the chair of the department. Professor Mary Christianakis, and who's also a co-founder with uh, Professor Heldman of The Matrix, and Professor Kai Small of CTSJ. So welcome to you all, welcome here. So let me just tell you quickly a little bit about the series before we get going. Uh, the series in general, broadly, which started this summer, focuses on pressing current events and seeks to connect our community with experts, scholars, artists, and activists who are changing our world for the better. So as I said, this is part of our fall series, which will focus in large part on art and activism. And we will have a series as well uh, entitled Black Women in Hollywood. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. So look out for announcements and registration links that'll be coming to your inbox this weekend or go to oxy.edu slash matrix if you're watching this on the internets. So um, we're also hosting a second series uh, this fall. Um, that's focused on California and immigration in conjunction with a course in our department taught by Professor Christianakis called the California Immigration Semester. So you can not only find us at oxy.edu slash matrix to watch videos of prior events, including this one, which will be posted right after the event. You can also find us on Instagram at CTSJ Oxy, and that, there you'll see um, announcements for uh, new, uh, new shows. Um, we also have a YouTube channel uh, which you can look up or just access through uh, the oxy.edu matrix website. Okay, so very briefly, next Thursday, September 3rd at noon, because that's our new time. Some of you used to join us on Wednesdays. We'll be talking to uh, Tomas Jimenez, um, whose topic will be the other side of assimilation, how immigrants are changing American life. Uh, professor Jimenez is a professor of sociology and comparative studies in race and, race and ethnicity um, at Stanford. And on Thursday, September 10th, we'll start off our Black Women in Hollywood series with Lily Bernard, the powerful Lily Bernard, who's a visual artist, actor, and activist. Uh, if you were here last fall, if you happen to be around last fall and you were lucky enough to attend um, the event we had with her, uh, you know how transformative just spending an hour with her can be. Okay, so please note that we're using the webinar format rather than the regular meeting format. And you can see there's a Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. So you just go ahead and click on that if you're attending live, and we'll get to those questions as soon as we can. Okay, now I get to introduce uh, Barrett Martin, Professor Barrett Martin, sometime Professor Barrett Martin, when he has time. So uh, Barrett Martin is a Latin Grammy-winning producer, composer, percussionist, and writer, author. Um, he's been playing music professionally for over 30 years, including work on over 100 albums worldwide. That makes me dizzy. His work can be heard on albums by R.E.M., Queens of the Stone Age, Mad Season, and the Screaming Trees. Of, you, know, you, you heard a little snippet of Screaming Trees song, uh, I Nearly Lost You. To Atara, Blues Legend, Sedell Davis, and recording sessions that range from the Peruvian Amazon, which we'll talk about today, to Brazil, Cuba, the Palestinian West Bank, the Mississippi Delta, and the Elastic, Alaskan Arctic. Barrett also holds a master's degree in ethnomusicology and linguistics. Um, and taught um, in several colleges, including Antioch College. His practice Zen in various martial arts, including using the katana, apparently, for over 25 years. He's taught, okay, um, he's written essays for Huffington Post and Riot Material in 2014. He was awarded the ASCAP, I think I said that right, Deems, uh, Deems Taylor Virgil Thompson Award for Excellence in Writing. And in 2017, he won a Latin Grammy for producing the best Brazilian rock album, how great is that? Nando Rice is, uh, I forget how they do that there. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Um, his first book, The Singing Earth, was released in 2017. His second one, The Way of the Zen Cowboy, excellent, was released on 2019. And his solo band, The Barrett Martin Group, can be found at barrettmartin.com, by the way. Great set of videos, great access. He's released, and that group has released nine studio albums to date. So he's a busy man. Welcome, Barrett. Thank you, Malik. It's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, be able to speak uh, virtually at Occidental College again. Yeah, it's so great to have you here. Um, so I should confess uh, to the video that I 
so my college years, some of our, our students will be watching, were spent really enjoying the music of uh, the bands you played in and the Screaming Trees in particular, a favorite of mine. Um, but it's really quite a journey, man. That bio is something else. Um, you've been a lot of places, both you know, physically and uh, intellectually and spiritually. So I was wondering, maybe you can just tell us a little bit how you go from being the wild-eyed uh, rock drummer um, in the early 90s or late 80s, early 90s, um, and worked your way towards becoming a professor, um, becoming a celebrated author. Like, how did that happen? Oh, well, that is a long journey, but I'll, I'll do the, I'll, yeah. do the short, <laughs> I'll do the cliff note version of it. I don't think that's a very normal journey, Barrett, to go from, you know, the, the stage, the stages that you were on to being a ethnomusicologist at Antioch College. That's unusual. Yes, it is. But, you know, like a lot of things in life, like, a, I think everybody probably has a story like this, where you start off doing one thing and you end up doing something else. And, you know, sometimes, the, you know, they're connected sort of broadly or thematically, but, but as you get older, you refine your, your interests and your skills, and it just sort of takes you to these different places. But, but the, the short story is, is that, um, I, I grew up in Washington State in a, in a pretty musical family, and so I was always playing some kind of music. And when I was younger, it was uh, pretty much jazz. Like, I, I was very late to the rock and roll thing. I, I didn't discover rock and roll until I was, you know, nearly graduating from high school and going to college. And of course, I knew about it, but it, it wasn't like a big influence on me. I was really influenced by jazz. So that's what I studied all through high school. And, you know, when I went to college, the first time I was on a music scholarship, so I studied jazz and classical. Um, and I was also studying composition in tandem with, you know, my, my various instruments. Um, and then I moved to Seattle in 1987. And this was, you know, the, 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 the nascent of the, um, the Seattle music scene, you know, the early early uh, alternative music and grunge and really a lot of exciting music was happening in Seattle at that time, not just rock and roll, but there was all kinds of alternative experimental music happening. And so I was this jazz drummer trying to find a band to play with and ended up playing in a series of bands until I ended up in the Screaming Trees. And uh, that band had, you know, wasn't, wasn't as big of a band as like Pearl Jam or Nirvana or some of those kind of bands, but you know, we had, pretty big global success. I got to tour all over the world. And in doing that touring, I also did a lot of individual traveling to other countries. So I ended up going to, uh, well, I, I don't know how many countries, but dozens of countries uh, on six continents. And I got really interested in world music. Hmm. So by the time the year 2000 rolled around, which unbelievably is already 20 years ago, but Around the year 2000, I started thinking about going back to school to continue my music education. And I was living in New Mexico at the time, and there, there happened to be a couple of really great ethnomusicologists at the University of New Mexico. So I started taking classes, and next thing I knew, I was accepted into graduate school, uh, which, which was actually to work on my PhD. And I completed my master's, but I never completed my PhD. It, it was just taking a very long time and I needed to get back into playing music. So um, during graduate school, I ended up working in the Peruvian Amazon with uh, an indigenous people uh, called the Shipibo, and I worked with them and still continue to work with them. Um, and I also, I did a number of projects around the world that some of which were related to graduate work and some of which were just my own projects. And, uh, and I, I'm still essentially doing that today. I mean, I did teach at Antioch for seven years, um, starting about 2010, uh, until just, you know, a couple of years ago is when I yeah. um, resigned, uh, only because I was getting so busy with my, my record label and my book projects, and I just kind of needed to focus on that full time. How did your graduate, what kind of graduate work were you doing? You must have been working towards your dissertation, right? So yes, what was yeah. that led you to work with uh, the Amazonian uh, tribal music? Yes, yes. I, uh, yeah, I had completed all of my coursework and I was doing uh, field work with the Shipibo in the upper Peruvian Amazon 
uh, along the Ucayali River, which is one of the headwaters of the Amazon. And basically what, what my field work was, was to record and document their sacred curing songs, which are called Icaros, um, of which I recorded uh, well over a hundred. I mean, there's a, I haven't exactly added them all up, but somewhere between 100 and 150 Icaros. And these are sacred songs that are used uh, in traditional healing ceremonies. So the belief is that music can heal the spirit and the body just by itself, but it can also be used in tandem with Amazonian herbs and tinctures and, and uh, diff different kinds of um, ceremonies. So I was recording, documenting, and, and doing a basic ethnography of Shipibo music um, and what was happening to them uh, in you know, the year 2004, which, which is after the internet had been introduced, but was still, you know, in, in that part of the Amazon is very remote. So they were still a little bit cut off from what was happening in the outside world. And, um, and obviously a lot of that has changed in the last 15 years. So, so then I ended up releasing two albums of this music. This is traditional sacred music, uh, literally recorded in, in the, the main village, um, which is called San Francisco de Yerina Cocha. And uh, we released those albums through my record label, which is distributed by Sony. And 100% of the royalties goes to, to these uh, singing shamans. So it's actually been a really good fundraising project for them. And it's raised awareness about, you know, the difficulties that they currently face in the Amazon with the encroachment of, of wildfire. Uh, well, it's not wild because it's, they're lit by human beings deliberately to burn down the rainforest to basically steal land. And, uh, and then of course, ongoing illegal logging and uh, gold mining, which releases horrible toxic chemicals into the, into the water. So they're, they're facing a multitude of, of issues, but the more people know about them and know about this ancient culture, the more there is a movement to uh, protect them. How did you end up um, being able to record them? So I imagine that is not that simple and both like technologically speaking, but also to work out the right way for it to happen, um, the proper relationship with the, you know, the shamans and all that. How, how did that happen? Well, uh, as probably a lot of people who have done field work can attest, opportunities present themselves and you just kind of jump at it when they, when they come to you because it's hard to instigate this kind of thing unless you're invited into an indigenous group like that. And so in my case, there was already a, a documentary film project that had been started by an outside group. They were not academics. They were just people that were working to help and protect the Shipibo. And they needed an ethnomusicologist to help record and document the, the music. So um, I can't even remember exactly how it was presented to me, but, but but somehow I got an email or a phone call and I was asked if I'd be interested. And it just happened to be right around the time that I was getting ready to do field work. And so I presented it to my committee and they were like, heck yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing that, uh, that you want to do. And I was lucky because the people on my committee were um, anthropologists that had worked in the Amazon and, and they were ethnomusicologists. So it was just like a kind of a perfect situation. So, to be invited into an indigenous group, you know, that's a very special thing. And, and so um, the day we arrived, they immediately put us into ceremony because as the head shaman said, and the head shaman was a woman, by the way, because this is a matriarchal culture. Most of the shamans are women and the women just kind of run everything. And it's awesome. <laughs> it's totally, it's really great how they do it down there. And uh, they immediately put us into ceremony because they said, if we're going to bring you into our village and, you know, reveal all of this information, we, we need to clean you of your Western toxicity and programming. And, and, uh, and that's, that's what they did. That would happen. Um, <laughs> how, did they, um, how did the recording go? So were they um, uh, leading some of the recording how, for how you should go about doing it and what kinds of things that were being recorded? What was the relationship and the working relationship with the tribal uh, leaders in this regard? Well, okay, so to, to begin with, the way that 
we were taught in graduate school about how to do this is one way, right? This sort of like, like a technical and, and, and also, you know, respectful and, and uh, um, a conscious way of doing this. And then you get into an indigenous tribal village and it's how they want to do it. So it was kind of a combination of the two. By the time I got to the village, I already had done a lot of recording on my own as a professional musician, but I had to get all of this portable equipment that would run on batteries because there was no electricity at, at the time. Now, now there's electricity and internet and it's, it's very modernized in that sense. But in 2004, there was no electricity, no internet. It was just run everything on battery power. So, um, I would just kind of, you know, everything was portable. I could literally wear the recording equipment and hold the microphones and just kind of run around following shamans around. When, and when they decided to sing a song and they wanted us to record it, I would record it. And then, of course, we did a lot of ceremonies where I was able to formally set up, record, and everybody knew we were recording and, and it was much more um, organized. But as the week, weeks went by, you know, you start to develop these relationships. You start to realize who the best singers are and who the real shamans are, like the ones that have the real power and are respected in the village and, and they want to tell their story and they, they want their songs to be recorded. So it was really driven by what they wanted to sing and what they wanted to reveal to the world. And then it was just my responsibility to show up and be there at the right time and be ready to press record. So it, it was really, uh, it was very magical, but that's actually the word I would use. It was a really magical experience how it all unfolded. And then I had to bring all the recordings back and everything was recorded on digital tape and then we had to process it into computers and organize it. And uh, the editing and the mixing is, is really what took the most amount of time. Okay, and so, um... I have a couple more questions about that, but maybe we'll yeah. move forward a little bit. But um, you were talking about uh, the uh, pressures um, and the sort of exploitation uh, um, uh, of these people, you know, by sort of land grabs and so on. How, what's happened since then? So you were able to raise this money for them, uh, yeah. help them, well, they raised money for themselves, essentially. You put out the record for them. Um, what's happened with them? What's the situation with them now? Well, my wife and I went back there in 2018 to record another album. And, and, and also I had so much leftover music and I wanted to see if they wanted to release it and make another album that would be kind of a combination of archival music and some of the, some of the new shamans. Because in the interim years, a couple of the main shamans had passed away and there were some new young shamans that were, you know, children of those shamans and they were starting to sing and, and you know, really put their, put their singing out to the world. So we went back, recorded some more songs, Icaros, I should say, because um, an Icaro is specifically a sacred song. So we recorded a bunch of new Icaros and went through the archives of the older Icaros I'd recorded in 2004. And that was a really, again, magical experience because there were children, grandchildren and actually some great grandchildren of those original shamans and we were sitting around in the in the longhouse on my laptop and I'm playing them these songs that were recorded 15 years earlier and they were hearing their grandmothers sing for the first time they'd never heard you know because nobody had made recordings of them back then so and this was another lesson for me in um in field work is that it turns out some of the Icaros I had translated slightly wrong. I mean, not egregiously because my Spanish is good enough. I could understand, you know, what, but, you know, I, I missed some of the subtleties of it. And so going back and we refined some of those, the titles and the meanings, and they, they picked songs that they wanted on the next record, which came out in 2000, early 2019. So now there's two, two albums that we've put out. And we just kind of perfected everything, you know, because that's part of the process. It's like, it's not just done because you were there one time. It's an ongoing process. So then the final thing is that when we were there, uh, there, had, there was a big um, event that had happened. You might've heard about it in the news. There was a, a Canadian drug trafficker that had been in the village and had killed one of the, sh one of the shamans, had, had shot her and killed her. 
and the tribe took uh, immediate revenge and killed him. I, I think they, they hung him, I think is how they killed him. But I mean, that's tribal justice in the Amazon. Like you, you kill somebody, there's gonna be revenge or justice of some kind. So they had killed this Canadian drug trafficker and the Peruvian government came in and said, you know, you're savages and we're gonna take your land or threatening to take their land. So while we were there, there was a huge protest in Pucallpa, which is the largest frontier town in uh, the upper Peruvian Amazon. And so we marched with the Shipibo. And I, I will say it was actually a really beautiful and powerful protest because it was mostly women, or I mean, it was men and women, but the women led the march and they were all in their traditional clothing. And there were Peruvian police, but they did not carry their guns. Mm. They deliberately, and I even talked to one of the officers and he said, yeah, we, we don't want to show up to something like this with guns. We don't need guns. We don't want to, you know, show that kind of force. So, so the Peruvian police protected the Shipibo. They marched and uh, it was a big, big protest, yeah. but it didn't really make the news. You know, it just kind of came and went. So, so we, we're in touch with them through email. We talk with them all the time. Um, the good side of it is that uh, there, there is still tourist money coming into that village. I mean, the, the, the albums have made thousands of dollars for them, many thousands of dollars, and that's actually attracted tourists and people that go to study with the shamans and learn traditional healing. So, so there's a, a very positive side of that. Um, the negative side is that uh, there's probably this going to be this ongoing extractive illegal extractive industry that's always going to be encroaching on them. Yeah. So, you know, obviously beyond being a scholar of music and all that, you, you see this music as um, transformative, political, you know, and important for social justice and social change. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, your interest in that aspect of music and how you see music operating as a part of your activism, both cultural and environmental, which both those things, both things you said were. Well, this, this is a hugely broad uh, statement that I'm going to make, but, but it's because music is such a broad universal thing. Uh, when I was teaching at Antioch and, uh, and, and it, 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 it's just something that I do, whether I'm teaching or not, is, is, is that I, I try to express how music is inherently a transformative art form. In, in fact, it's beyond an art form. It's like this, it's, it's an internal energy that all of us have. You know, some of us are music makers, some of us are music listeners, or, you know, we all have different roles that we play, but we all participate in music in one way or another. And, when you look around the world at all of the major music movements that have happened, so the American Civil Rights Movement created some of the most powerful music and songwriting in the history of the United States. Or you go to South America, Central and South America in the Spanish speaking countries and you have the Nueva Canción Movement, which started in the 1960s and was um, a way to look at traditional indigenous and folkloric music as a form of cultural expression, but it also became this big political movement against the totalitarian presidents that ruled many of those countries in the 1960s and 70s. Or you go to Brazil and you look at Tropicalia, which was sort of the Brazilian equivalent of Nueva Canción, but that was an enormously influential um, movement and it influenced a lot of American musicians too because it incorporated music and playwriting and filmmaking and poetry and visual art and it basically was an expression of individual freedom and joy and believe it or not that was hugely revolutionary and and was a pushback against the Brazilian uh, military junta that ruled Brazil from I think about 1964 to 1984. Mm. Um, or like West Africa, you have the Afrobeat movement um, pioneered by people like Fela Kuti and other artists like that, which was a merger of American 
uh, R and B and soul with traditional African rhythms and um, and 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 a, and a revolutionary attitude to push back against what what is still an ongoing problem in Nigeria, which is the rule of the government by oil companies and the Nigerian military. So um, I'm trying to think of some other examples, but um, of course, you know, we have the punk rock movement in, in the United Kingdom and in the United States, and that led to the alternative music movement in the late 1980s and early 90s that I was a part of. So all over the world, you find examples of music um, transforming the culture and progressing it socially and politically and economically and in some cases spiritually. Um, and there's a lot of other, in fact, now I'm remembering, you know, some of my students who wrote excellent research papers about this very thing. And like, I remember this one student wrote a paper about um, punk rock in Burma. Now, I would have never known that there was a punk rock scene in Burma, but there is. Uh, or Myanmar, I should say. Wait, no. I guess yeah. it's the, the proper term, but there is a punk rock movement in Myanmar, which is some, some form of pushback against the, the military um, oppression that has happened in that country for a very long time. So all over the world, you find music pushing back against hegemonical power structures. And I mean, that's what rock and roll is. And before rock and roll, there was the blues and, and the, the music of black people in the Mississippi Delta pushing back against the, the oppression that those people felt. So it, it's a very, very long, <laughs> I mean, this is, it's all connected and it goes for a very long time backwards in time and is continuing to this day. So you're, so I'm going to ask you sort of a, a slightly odd question and maybe impossible to answer, but so not only do you obviously love music and you study music as a scholar, but you create music. Um, what is it do you think? I mean, uh, this is a quick, odd question, I know. Um, I know that visual art, uh, this is some, one of the things I work on, the role of visual art in graffiti and poster art in political movements, how important it is, the iconography of it, how it can galvanize people. But in all of these movements, the ones I study in the Middle East, for instance, music plays a crucial role. And uh, it's, it's sort of, it happens organically. Like oftentimes it's old songs being remade uh, in a new context and they become these galvanizing events. And it seems like that's the stuff that people remember most. Like I tend to keep the posters, right? Or the graffiti, images of the graffiti, but it's the songs that keep being sung after. And I guess as a musician, I'm wondering, what do you, and as a scholar of music, what do you think it is about music that is so affecting and so powerful um, in helping sort of push along um, movements, social justice movements. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the Middle East and I was, of course, my mind was thinking of examples of that. And the first thing I thought of was Umm Kathum in uh, Egypt. Yes. Uh, and Umm Kathum is this early 20th century singer of, of what was, you know, traditional folk songs of the Egyptian people. And somehow she was able to remind the Egyptian people of their roots, of, of you know, their great traditional values and this ancient culture. And she, as she got older, she rose and became, you know, pretty much the most famous person to ever come from Egypt, uh, aside from uh, uh, Cleopatra, probably. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, by the end, she was performing with huge orchestras on television and just inspiring all of the people to remember who they were as Egyptians. And it forced the British to uh, essentially flee and, and, and leave Egypt. I mean, correct me if I've got some of the history. No, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But Umkafum is perfect. That's exactly yeah. the kind of thing I'm talking about because some of that got picked up in the Arab Spring as well. The, you know, right. some of those, um, redoing of them in these, um, very, um, like these young people redoing those songs with really rudimentary instruments and almost no understanding of music, but they still have this revolutionary force, this sort of galvanizing energetic force. You call that kind of energy, right? So um, it's very interesting. So I think of, for instance, um, uh, the, the idea of a kind of a pre-linguistic almost uh, mood transforming character uh, of music, right? In addition to the ways we can talk about it intellectually. But that's certainly a great example. I think that's is literally what I was thinking of, so. Oh, yeah, you had yeah. that same thought. Well, I just thought that's the best example because, 
I think that there's something about, um, well, and there's, a, you know, you can connect this to hip hop. You know, this is what I love about global music studies is that you can find these parallels and these connections from something as far away as Egypt, but as local as hip hop in New York City, because you mentioned graffiti and visual art and things like that. And so there's something about how the music conveys the, uh, the cultural ornamentation of the people in such a way that it, it reminds them about something about themselves and about their values and about their people and, and, and the things that are important to them. And that can be represented in, in the visual art and in the graffiti. Um, and, it's, and, and of course, we're in the realm of semiotics now, right? So we're talking about how symbolically, you know, this is expressed in music. So it can be expressed in, uh, obviously, in the language, the use of certain words that code certain memories and certain um, innuendo. Uh, but it's also in things like the clothing and in the hairstyles and, and the instrumentation. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of an example that I, that I learned about when I was in school about apartheid in South Africa and about how the use of Mabatanga music, which is a uh, traditional music, well, it's pop music, but it uses uh, indigenous uh, words and codes from the Zulu and the, the Hosa people of South Africa. And <laughs> this is like the greatest story of, uh, of subversion is that South Africa at the time had, had these really strict radio censors that would listen to every song that was going to get played on the radio and decide if there was anything in it that was revolutionary or would instigate revolutionary thought or movement and they would just, you know, repress it and not play it. And the Mabatanga singers figured out how to put in these little coded words and phrases that the, the, the censors never picked up on. They didn't do the research. They didn't even no, and this music was getting played on, you know, mainstream radio in South Africa with these, with these coded words and phrases that inspired people to rise up. Oh, that, that's, that's right. So, yes. So I, I'm doing some courses right now where we'll be talking about the role of both hip hop and weirdly psychedelic rock yeah. in the Iranian revolution and post-revolutionary movements. And it's as much attitude, right, uh, and, and dress, as you said, as it is repurposing the language of, you know, traditional resistance ideas in the culture. That's, that's amazing. That's great. Um, uh, so you've done a lot of different work. So let me, because we're going to run out of time, bizarrely. Um, but I wanted to ask you about um, your work uh, in the Alaskan um, Arctic wildlife, uh, wildlife Refuge. You're working with some tribes up there as well. Um, and how that um, that worked for you, and what's what's going on up there? Maybe get us up to speed. Okay, so uh, I live in Washington, and I've been up to Alaska, which is you know kind of our next door neighbor, just north. I've been up there several times, and I, I uh, I've lectured at the University of Alaska in Anchorage, and in fact, my former graduate advisor is the chair of Native Indigenous Studies at the University of Alaska. And she told me that the indigenous Gwich'in people who live in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge wanted to do a music project to help raise awareness about protecting the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. And just a quick background on that for everybody that's listening. The Arctic Wildlife Refuge is considered to be the last complete ecosystem in North America. Like it, it is still pristine and un, un, uh uninhibited by, by outside forces. It is the largest wor uh, uh, bird migration hub in uh, the Western Hemisphere. Birds come from all over the world and they, they sort of like, you know, feed on all the fish and the insects and they fatten up and then they fly to every continent on the planet. It's also where the largest caribou herds in the world migrate through there. And I mean, caribou herds that are in the tens of thousands. I mean, it's just massive. That's gotta be amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, wolf packs and, and grizzly bears. And I mean, it's just like the most wild place in North America. And the oil companies want to go drill and put, put in platforms and, you know, basically destroy it. And anybody that knows about Alaskan oil drilling, um, there are spills in Alaska every day. You just don't hear about it in the news because it's so common that literally every day 
there's a spill, the pipeline leaks somewhere, or one of the rigs has a leak. It's just constant. So the indigenous people that live in the wildlife refuge have been working for decades to keep the oil companies out. And the Trump administration is trying to sell leases and they're forcing it through and federal judges have ruled that it's unconstitutional to do that. And all of the environmental scientists worth their salt have all said, this is insane, like literally insane to yeah. try to drill for oil in this last corner. So a year ago, I was invited up there. It was literally the summer solstice of 2019. And I spent 10 days up there in the refuge, which is actually the second time that I've been there. This, so it's not the first time, but second time. Uh, I'd already established these relationships with the elders and the chiefs. And what they wanted to do was tell stories and do traditional music. Hmm. So literally, right before I talked with you today, I got the final master back. And, and the master is the, the, the final mastered mixes of the album that we're going to put out. And it's about 35 short stories and songs about what it's like to live in the refuge and all of the animals and the beauty of it, but also the danger of, of oil encroachment and extractive industries. So that album will be coming out very, very soon. And it will be just like the Shipibo album that I did in the Amazon, where 100% of the royalties will go to the tribe, goes to the tribal council. They can distribute it however they wish. And more importantly, it could be used as a tool to give to, I mean, it'll be, it'll be distributed by Sony. So you can hear it on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, all those places. Yeah. And it can be used as a tool to help make people aware of what's going on up there. That's amazing. Um, and so this was, um, you show up and are, what, what's your role when you show up? Are you um, helping them curate things? Are you just like, I'm here with my, I guess now you have, a, they have, you know, full electric, whatever, you don't have to wear the battery powered stuff, but you're, you're just setting up a recording studio and you didn't say very much about, although I read something about you setting up a recording studio in 2004 uh, in Peru. Uh, but so what is that process like? Um, what do you do? Just as a brief thing, sure. you want to get these people, they're going to tell stories, they're going to, um, in Peru, they're singing sacred songs. Um, what's recording sacred music like for you? Well, I, 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 as you said, in, uh, when I was in the Peruvian Amazon, we actually did set up a, a little mini recording studio in an abandoned uh, thatched roof little hut and we hung microphones from the ceiling and we had our little battery powered recording. It was all digital recording. And we just sort of allowed the shamans to come in and um, you know, whatever they wanted to sing, we would just record it, whatever, yeah. whatever they wanted to record. And, uh, and that, that was really a pretty special experience, you know, to actually set up this little temporary studio. And then in the Arctic wildlife refuge, um, well, it's kind of the opposite situation. They had electricity, but no running water. So, so um, you, have, you have to pack all your, well, there is a, a water source, but there's no running water in the, um, you know, in, in uh, that's not exactly, I should rephrase that. They have some run, running water, but they don't have um, uh, like sewage systems or anything like that. So every, every, it's, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like camping in cabins is kind of what it's right, like. Right. So we found, you know, this really great community building where we set up microphones and, um, and we just had, we set up a time frame and it spanned several days and the elders would just come and they would do storytelling. And so I would just record the whole thing. So I think there was about 17 hours of storytelling. I mean, it's a, it's, it was a lot. And so, how do you shave 17 hours of storytelling down into a 70 minute CD, right? So that's where I just sat with headphones for days going through and kind of picking the best parts of it, you know, because you're trying to synthesize 20,000 years of continual existence by the indigenous people and, and how they want to present that to the world. So then the second part of it was that after I'd rough mixed everything and I made, you know, some mock-up CDs, I sent those to the tribal council and they had to be circulated amongst the kind of the main storytellers and elders until they found a consensus on what they liked. And, and actually they liked everything, but nothing was rejected. So, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a complex process, but I think if you go into it uh, really trying to represent what, what they want to say, you know, the stories that they want to tell and the message that they want to get across, I think if you keep that as kind of your prime directive, um, yes, there may be songs and stories that they don't want you to include, but in general, I think that that's, that's how you hit the mark, is really right. try to just say for them what they want to say. Right. Um, and it sounds like they were very involved at every stage, obviously, right? Sort of directing, yeah. I should say, rather than involved, directing at every stage. Um, right. Now, listen, so we're, you know, we're going to take some questions and all that, and uh, Professor Heldman um, has some questions in reserve. Um, but I do want to ask you, so you've got this collaborative, I guess a collective, uh, this uh, Barrett Martin, what do you call it? Barrett Martin group, I think you're calling it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, people should go to barrettmartin.com and look at some of these videos. They're an incredible collection of musicians from around the world playing all kinds of different styles. Uh, it seems like, um, but one of the videos you're playing um, in this Dueling Shamans video, which is one of my favorites. Sorry, I'm, I'm running the interview. I get to bring up the ones I like. Um, um, you're playing with another drummer uh, who was exceptional, and it was a really great sort of back and forth. Um, can you say something about this, this group you're, you're working with and who these musicians are? Yeah, uh, well, I call it the Barrett Martin group because group is just encompassing enough that it can be whoever I want it to be. So I've, I have this long relationship of working with world musicians from, from literally around the world. And uh, that particular video that you're talking about is, is me and a Senegalese Wolof drum master kind of having a drum battle, you know, yeah. kind of like, a, like Buddy Rich versus Max Roach or something. Right. Right. And um, he, this, is, this is a guy that I've known for 25 years and I studied with his father in Senegal back in the late 1990s. And, uh, and he was just a teenager back then. And now he's, you know, a full adult man with his own family. And we still play together. And so we just, you know, continue to do these kind of uh, collaborations. But the, the new record that comes out tomorrow, actually, uh, oh, it's called... Times by Us. Yeah, yeah. I, I just happen to have a record coming out tomorrow called Scattered Diamonds. And it involves, for example... Uh, Rahim al Haj, who is a world-renowned Iraqi oud master. And the oud is like the grandfather of the guitar. It's thousands of years old. So he and I collaborated on two songs. Uh, there's a Hindustani singer from Mumbai, India named Manaz Hussain, and she did some traditional Hindustani singing on a couple of songs. Uh, there are the Senegalese drum master that you mentioned, uh, Chon Diop is his name. He's on a couple songs. There's a Ghanaian drum master that I recorded when I was in Ghana, uh, literally tw uh, tw 25 years ago. Um, and uh, there's also a wide variety of American jazz musicians and rock musicians. Um, and we all just have known each other for many years. And somehow I'm the guy that brings everybody together in the studio. You're the ringmaster in that one. Uh, <laughs> it's really great. So, uh, Professor Heldman, uh, do you have some follow-up questions for us? Uh, so many, but I just to be a little surface here, you just brought up uh, your work in the production studio. Barrett, uh, one most memorable, notable moment from a studio session and one most memorable or, or notable moment from the road. There's a really, okay, the, the, I've got a great, memory from when I was in the Peruvian Amazon in 2004 and we were recording shamans in this little rainforest studio that we built and there was this little uh, Shipibo girl and her, I remember her name was Daisy and and she had never heard a recording and so we recorded her singing and, and I put my headphones on so she could hear herself what it sounded like and I remember her smile and her she was laughing she just had no idea that that's what a recording sounded like. So that, that, that stands out to me more than, you know, all the, the big rock bands that I recorded with. Um, but on the road, um, oh, it's probably, I'm gonna say that it was the, the 1992 Reading Festival when the Screaming Trees opened for Nirvana mm. in, in Reading in the United Kingdom. And uh, that particular day had a lot of great American bands that it was the 
the Screaming Trees, Mud Honey, the Beastie Boys, um, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, uh, L7, which is that they're actually back playing shows again, and a, a couple other I can't can't remember everybody, and then Nirvana headlined, and I think that might have been one of the last live shows they ever played, <clears throat> and it was incredible. It was incredible. Never. That's exactly how rock and roll should be played. <laughs> And and I think that it's out. I think it's out as a DVD, or it's you can look watch it on the internet. But that's how a rock band should play. Nirvana, nineteen ninety two at the Reading Festival. Wow, that's outstanding. We do have a question from Bill. He would like to know what your first live concert was. What the first live concert you attended? Oh, the first live concert I attended was in nineteen eighty. 1983 or 84 and it was Rush and it was the uh, Grace Under Pressure tour and it was incredible it was incredible because you know as a drummer how could you not everybody loves Neil Peart you know he's like one of the greatest drummers of all time and uh, then the early 80s was a cool time to see concerts because it was still I mean it was totally live you know you couldn't like really have backing tracks or you couldn't fake it but pretty advanced production as far as lights and all of that. So it was a, it was a big influence. And can you tell us a bit about your work with Joy Harjo? Uh, yeah. Now? Okay, so Joy Harjo is the current poet laureate of the United States. Uh, she's a Muscogee indigenous woman and probably the most well-known uh, like native female poet uh, in, in the world right now. I mean, she's just an incredible poet and storyteller. And I've been reading her books for years and I've known Joy for about 20 years because um, she was also on the faculty at the University of New Mexico when I was there. And so Joy and I have, I've played shows with her and for 20 years we've talked about working together. And finally she said, all right, I want to make a record. I want to do spoken word and sing and she is bringing the best and most famous of her poems over her entire career and i've been putting music to it and so she was just out here in washington at our home and she and i recorded live together i would play drums she would uh, do her spoken word and sing and then we would just start adding instrumentation to it and i'm actually going to her home in tulsa in October and we're going to finish the album in Tulsa and get more of the traditional Muscogee singers to do backup vocals on it. So it's, um, it's, I, it's really a powerful record. I mean, even though right now it's just in basic track form, I mean, if you've ever heard Joy Harjo speak and you can only imagine when she's, you know, doing her, I mean, she's a, she's a shaman. She's a real thing. And, and real shamans have that ability to take the spoken word and turn it into magic. And that's what she does. So I think her album will come out early next year. Okay. Along those lines, what is a Zen cowboy? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that one out myself, but I, you know, I grew up in the, the woods of uh, Western Washington, pretty close to the end of the Oregon Trail. I don't know if people know this, but the Oregon Trail ends right here in Olympia, Washington, which is where I am. The, the trail ended here. And so I grew up not far from the end of the Oregon Trail and grew, like our neighbors were actual cowboys. So I grew up riding horses, stretching barbed wire fence, raising animals, slaughtering chickens. I mean, I, I lived that lifestyle when I was, up until I was about 18 and I went to college. So I was pretty influenced by like actual cowboys, like real cowboys that really, they were a great example in their work ethic and their, their honesty and their integrity and, and their connection to the land, you know? Because a real cowboy understands that the land is life and you have to be connected to it and you have to respect it and revere it and protect it. And that's where life comes from. So I had that influence as a, as a young man. And then I went on to study Zen which I've done for about 25 years. And so at this point, the two have merged together for me. 
and it was a good book title. I mean, right. at the end of the day, you got to come up, you got to come up with a title that people go, I like that. I, re I can remember that, you know, it's not too complicated and it kind of says it all in two words. Yeah. 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 It's brilliant, brilliant marketing, but also very accurate, right? Whatever it is. I was, yeah. And you've, you've defined it. It is not, it's not definable, which is beautiful. Um, I know that there are probably some other folks with questions, but I happen to know that you have um, some pretty pointed critiques about the music industry today. And so I'm hoping you can speak about, you know, the alternative modes of distribution that you've developed, your critique of the industry, and also um, people who are hoping to get into it now. It's a very different beast than it was in the late 80s. Yeah. Well, it's funny you bring that up because right this morning when I was reading the news, I, I saw an article about how the music industry is back to making tens of billions of dollars a year, but it's all coming from digital distribution. It's all coming from streaming and mostly streaming. Uh, people still download, but not, not like they used to because now you can stream and get it for free or for a small subscription rate. So that's all fine, right? That's just technology. Um, in some ways I really like that because um, plastic CDs, just generates a lot of plastic, you know, that's not good. It's polluting to the planet. Um, vinyl actually does the same thing. And I know that might offend like the vinyl collectors out there, but pressing vinyl is plastic. And it's, we're just continuing to generate pollutants for the planet. So going to the digital realm, I do not think is inherently a bad thing. The problem is that the, the royalties do not come back to the artists. So um, like one of the metrics is you can have a song that gets streamed a million times. Now, a million is a lot for anybody to get a song streamed a million times or to have several, like people that have a successful album and they have millions and millions of streams. One million streams is like $5,000. That's about all you get in royalties. And then if you have a record label running screen between the artist and the distributor, then you can imagine that the artist isn't making any money or very, very little. So pretty soon that economic system is just gonna wind down and artists are not gonna have any real income with which to generate new music. And I just saw this thing where the, the CEO of Spotify, who is a multi-billionaire, was lecturing all the musicians that aren't releasing music constantly because it takes years sometimes to make an album. And he said something to the effect of like, you can't wait years to release music. You have to always be releasing music. Well, that's fine, you know, for, for the CEO of a company who is a multi-billionaire making money off other people's content and, and their artistic creation. But if you're not going to give any of that money back to the artist, I mean, it's just, you know, the system is going to collapse. I mean, and, and we're seeing that, I mean, this, the music industry is just a metaphor for late stage capitalism, which we're watching it collapse right now. Um, the music industry has always been predatory and exploitive of the artists. And some people figured out, I mean, I figured it out, but I mean, I learned what I learned from watching other people. Ray Charles started his own record label. The Beatles started their own record label. Led Zeppelin started their own record label. And then those of us that came up in the 80s recorded on independent labels. And some of us also recorded for major labels, but I'm back to having my own record label. So it's this delicate balance that you have to navigate where, you know, I go through Sony distribution and that way I'm able to get, you know, maximum global distribution. But when I see our royalty statements and I see how little that we're getting paid from Spotify or Amazon, you know, I, I mean, I can see the writing on the wall. It's not sustainable. It just isn't. So as long as you have uh, publicly traded companies that their only motivation is profit and profit going to the stockholders instead of to the artists, then you're going to have major problems. So, so Barrett, so this is your next role, right? So one more job for you, which is what, what do, you, do you imagine? Do you think about alternative ways of, for musicians and artists to present their work and get a fair, you know, fair value for what they've done? Right. 
Yes, and I and I and I have these conversations with people that I produce, or like for a really good example is working with indigenous people, and I tell them uh, because like when we were in the Amazon in 2018, the, the next generation of shamans, you know, they're like in their early 20s. And they're like, hey, with this next album, maybe don't make CDs because nobody, nobody's buying CDs in the Amazon. And, and I mean, it made me laugh because I'm like, yeah, they're not buying them in Seattle either, you know? I mean, a little bit, but not really. So they understand that digital is the way to reach everybody. You know, if their, their albums are up on, on Spotify and iTunes and Amazon, then people can find them. But we have to figure out how to put pressure on those companies to actually pay a, a much higher royalty rate. I mean, they're making billions of dollars and the stockholders are making billions of dollars, but it's all on the content that we've created and it's not coming back to the artists. Not, not in a fair commensurate way. Um, okay, so we have a ayahuasca question about okay. Jacobo people. And so I'll just, uh, boom, you, we'll be able to see it. So what kind of relationship does the Jacobo tribe have with, um, in, Theogens, I'm sorry, I just don't yeah. know that word. I, I, I love yeah. Okay. Um, are psychedelic experiences viewed as sacred in a way? Say the last part again. Um, are psychedelic experiences viewed as sacred? Yes, yes. And, and, and I did do the ayahuasca ceremony with the Shipibo shamans many times. And it is a sacred ceremony. And it's what the it's what the Shipibo have become famous for. So people from all over the world go there to do ayahuasca and have this psychedelic experience. But it's much more than that because you have to understand the subtlety of the ceremony itself. And the, and the whole idea is that when you have an internal vision, so we would call that a psychedelic experience, but it's really, it's a, it's a, a vision in the visual cortex of the brain. And when you have these visions and you're able to look inward on yourself and you know, kind of solve some of those riddles that each of us have about our life and maybe some of the traumas we've experienced, that is a healing experience. So the idea is that by, by doing the ayahuasca ceremony and having this vision, you are able to understand and process and heal yourself from you know, the traumas of your personal life. Um, I think people have, you know, kind of turned it into this recreational thing and, and it's not the way to do it and you should only do it with an authentic shaman and I think it's best if you do it in the Peruvian Amazon with those people because that's the thing that they can offer the world and it's a, it's a very important and powerful thing to experience. Um, but yeah, so I totally think it's a sacred thing. I really do. We are officially out of time. Oh, left. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Barrett, for coming on and sharing your, you know, sort of breadth of experience and depth of experience with us. Um, we will post this, um, you know, in, the, in places, and that's probably where many of you are seeing it right now. Um, and please check out uh, Barrett's work at barrettmartin.com. I think I have that right. Just your yep. name.com, right? Um, um, his writing, access to the books, uh, but also to these beautiful videos um, uh, that you, you, you can watch. Um, thank you, Barrett. Professor Heldman? Yeah, thank you so much, Barrett. Really fascinating conversation, and we hope to have another conversation with you again soon. Oh, I'd be honored. Thank you. I, I love talking with you, and uh, great questions from both of you, and, and um, just honored to be able to share those stories. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great one, and we'll see you next Thursday. Please wait. Uh, look for the video soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone.